C. H. Spurgeon's Autobiography. Chapter 11. The Great Change, Conversion. I have heard men tell the story of their conversion and of their spiritual life in such a way that my heart hath loathed them and their story too. For they have told of their sins as if they did boast in the greatness of their crime, and they have mentioned the love of God not with a tear of gratitude, not with a simple thanksgiving of the really humble heart, but as, as if they as much exalted themselves as they exalted God. Oh, when we tell the story of our own conversion, I would have it done with great sorrow, remembering what we used to be, and with great joy and gratitude, remembering how little we deserve these things. I was once preaching upon conversion and salvation, and I felt within myself, as preachers often do. But it was not but dry work to tell this story, and a dull, dull tale it was to me. But on a sudden the thought crossed my mind. Why, you are a poor, lost, ruined sinner yourself. Tell it, tell it as you received it. Begin to tell of the grace of God as you trust you feel it yourself. Why, then my eyes began to be fountains of tears. Those hearers who had nodded their heads began to brighten up, and they listened because they were hearing something which the speaker himself felt and which they recognized as being true to him if it was not true to them. Could you not remember, dearly beloved, the day of days, the best and brightest of hours when first you saw the Lord, lost your burden, received the world of promise, rejoiced in full salvation, and went on your way in peace. My soul can never forget that day. Dying, all but dead, diseased, pain, chained, scourged, bond in feathers of iron, in darkness, in the shadow of death, Jesus peered into me. My eyes looked to him, the disease was healed, the pains removed, chains were snapped, prison doors were opened, darkness gave place to light. What delight filled my soul, what mirth, what ecstasy, what sound of music and dancing, what soarings towards heaven, what heights and depths of ininflatable delight. Scarcely ever since then have I known joys which surpassed the rapture of that first hour. CHS Let our lips cloud sonnets within the compass of a word. Let our voice distill hours of melody into a simple syllabus. Let our tongue utter in one letter the essence of the harmony of ages. For we write of an hour which as far exceedeth all other days of our life as gold exceedeth dross. As the night of Israel's Passover was a night to be remembered, a theme for bards, and an incessant fountain of grateful song, even so is the time of which we now tell, the never to be forgotten hour our, of our emancipation from guilt and our justification in Jesus. Other days have mingled with their fellows till, like co coins worn in circulation, their image and superscription are entirely obli obliviated. But this day remaineth new, fresh, bright, as distinct in all its parts as if it were but yesterday, struck from the mint of time. Memory shall drop from the Palsy pan full many a memento which now she cherishes, but she shall never, even when she tortures in the grave, unbind from her heart the token of the thrice happy hour of the redemption of our spirit. The emancipated galley slave may forget the day which heard his broken feathers rattle on the ground. The pardoned traitor may fail to remember the moment when the axe of the headman was adverted by a pardon, and the long-despairing mariner 
may not recollect the moment when a friendly hand snatched him from the hungry deep. But, O oh, hour of forgiven sin, moments of perfect pardon, our soul shall never forget thee, while within her life, in being, find in immortality. Each day of our life have had its attendant angel, but on this day, like Jacob, at M-A-H-A-N-A-I-M, host of angels meet us. The sun hath risen every morning, but on that eventful morn he had the light of seven days, as the days of heaven upon earth, as the years of immortality, as the ages of glory, as the bliss of heaven. We were the hours of that thrice happy day, rapture divine and ecstasy inexpressible, filled our soul. Fear, distress, and grief, with all their train of woes, fled hastily away. In their place joys came within, without number. When I was in the hand of the Holy Spirit, under conviction of sin, I had a clear and sharp sense of the justice of God. Sin, whatever it might be to uh, other people, became to me an intolerable burden. It was not so much that I feared hell as that I feared sin, and all the while I had upon my mind a deep concern for the honor of God's name and the integrity of his moral government. I felt that it would not satisfy my conscience if I could be forgiven unjustly. But then there came the question, how could God be just and yet justify me, who had been so guilty? I was worried and wearied about this question. Neither could I see any answer to it. Certainly I could never have invented an answer which would have satisfied my conscience. The doctrine of the atonement is to my mind one of the surest proofs of the divine inspiration of Holy Scripture. Who would or could have thought of the just ruler dying for the unjust rebel? This is no teaching of human mythology or dream of poetic imagination. This method of expiation is only known among men because it is a fact. Friction, fiction could not have devised it. God himself ordained it. It is not a matter which could have been imagined. I have heard of the plan of salvation by the sacrifice of Jesus from my youth up, but I did not know any more about it in my innermost soul than if I had been born and bred a hot and hot. The light was there, but I was blind. It was of necessity that the Lord himself should make the matter plain to me. It came to me as a new revelation, as fresh as if I had never heard in Scripture that Jesus was declared to be the appropriation for sins that God might be just. I believe it will have to come as a revelation to every newborn child of God whenever he sees it. I mean that glorious doctrine of the substitution of the Lord Jesus. I came to understand that salvation was possible through a victorious sacrifice and that provision had been made in the first constitution and arrangement of things for such a substitution. I was made to see that he who is the Son of God, co-equal and co-eternal, with the Father, had of old been made the covenant head of the chosen people, that he might, in that capacity, suffer for them and save them. Inasmuch as our fall was not at the first a personal one, for we fell in our federal representation, the first Adam, it became possible for us to be recovered by a second representative, even by him who has undertaken to be the covenant head of his people, so as to be their second Adam. I saw that, ere I actually sinned, I had fallen by my first father's sin, and I rejoiced that, therefore, it became possible in point of law for me to rise by a second head and representative. The fall by Adam left a loophole of escape. Another Adam could undo the ruin wrought by the first. When I was anxious about the possibility of a just God pardoning me, I understood and saw by faith that he was, he who is the Son of God became man, and in his own blessed person bore my sin in his own body on the tree. 
I saw that the chastisement of my peace was laid on him, and that with his stripes I was healed. It was because the Son of God, the supremely glorious in his matchless person, undertook to vindicate the law by bearing his sentence due to me, that therefore God was able to pass by my sin. My sole hope for heaven lies in a full atonement made upon Calvary's cross for the ungodly. All oh, that I firmly rely. I have not the shadow of a hope anywhere else.